Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for State of the Arts conversation this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be talking about Dallas as a city of the imagination, city of stories, storytellers, and bookstores. The State of the Arts is presented by KERA's Art and Seek and the Dallas Museum of Art. And I'd like to uh, introduce our three guests this afternoon. Akwete Tahimba is the owner of the Pan-African Connection Bookstore and Resource Center in Dallas. She started the bookstore with her late husband in 1989. The Pan-African Connection is a community space that holds one of the largest collections in the South of authentic African art, Black African books, clothing, jewelry, and healthcare products. Akwete, welcome. Thank you. Lori Feathers is a freelance book critic, the author of the essay series, in context for the Literary Hub website, and she's a co-host of the books podcast, Across the Pond. She's a board member of the National Book Critics Circle and co-owner, co-founder of In Parabang Books in Dallas, and she is the founder of the new Republic of Consciousness Prize for Small Presses in the United States and Canada. Lori, welcome. Thanks for having me, Jerome. And Will Evans is an award-winning publisher, writer, translator, bookstore owner and literary arts advocate. He is the founder and CEO of Deep Vellum, the nonprofit publishing house, which he started in 2013, and he opened Deep Vellum Bookstore in 2015. Will, welcome. Thanks, Jerome. And for those of you watching this conversation, know that you can participate. You can join the conversation uh, underneath the, the video. There is a uh, chat section, so you can put your questions and your comments there, and we hope to get to them. Um, certainly by the end. So thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to open up with a question for all three, but I'm going to direct it first at, at Will because I suspect I know his answer and that will give Akwete and Lori time to think of theirs. Um, so you're in your bookstore, a uh, person walks in, they're a newcomer to Dallas, and they're interested in finding some book um, that gives them insight into Dallas. City's character, um, its history, uh, the nature of the people here, the businesses, whatever. And this book could be a biography, it could be a novel, it could be a history. So what book or books would you recommend and why? What is the story that book tells about Dallas for the newcomer? Will? That's a fantastic question. I mean, part of the reason uh, I opened Deep Ellum in Dallas was uh, to try to help find the stories of the city and to try and elevate them everywhere we can. It's part of the reason we opened a bookstore as well, as a way to engage these stories with readers, uh, whoever they may be, whether they're tourists or whether they're longtime Dallas residents or new residents of the city, like I was and relatively still am. I've only been here for eight years. And uh, when I moved here, I felt like literature and the arts were not necessarily united into one thing. And there were all these cool literary things happening. There were cool writers here. There have always been writers here. But if you walked into a bookstore in 2013 and said, what is the Dallas book? There weren't very many and there weren't very many Dallas bookstores. And so there was a problem of what is a, a unifying or even an, an elevating book in any genre that can connect everybody to the city that we call home. There have been stories set here. Um, there have been uh, writers who are based here who write great books that are not necessarily all about Dallas and the Dallas experience. And so something that we aim to do in our store is to find those stories and to connect them to everybody. And so. There still aren't a ton of great Dallas novels. There's not like the one great Dallas novel that we would point everyone to. And so the first question we'll ask as a bookseller, and this is something that goes far beyond the algorithm, is to say, what, what kind of stuff are you looking for? Are you looking for poetry, fiction, nonfiction? Do you want a picture book? And, and so that we could try to connect the reader with where they are in their reading journey and sort of what they desire. And so we recently published a, a work of nonfiction called The Accommodation by Jim Schutz. It's a, a vital work about Dallas and sort of why the city is the way that it is, um, focusing on the issues of structural and institutional racism here in the city. It's a really vital book. It doesn't paint a rosy picture of our city, but it paints an honest picture of our city. And that's something that everybody, you know, it, it serves a really vital role in helping galvanize change in our city. And so it's something we would definitely give to folks. Uh, we've also published a couple amazing books of poetry by Dallas poets, uh, and, and including one by Mike Soto, who's a first generation Mexican American poet who grew up in East Dallas. And we published a chat book by him called Dallas Spleen. And it's a really amazing, engrossing book that updates the Baudelaire book, Paris Spleen, for our own city. 
and it's set on one street corner in downtown. And when you read the book, you know it. And the buildings are a character and the history of the city is a character and you, the reader, are a character in the book. And that's a beautiful thing. And so we just want to be able to connect everybody with where they are. So it's something that we publish and we offer in the bookstore, but we do sell books they don't publish in the store. Those are just the two I landed on for this particular question, I swear. So, Lori. Well, I guess I would point first to two novels. I'm a, principally a, a novel reader. I do read in other genres, but um, two really good novels that, I, that come to mind when we talk about uh, novels set in Dallas or based in Dallas. One is a novel that was published last year by Edmund White, um, who is a New Yorker. And I don't know if he has ever spent a lot of time in Dallas, but yet I think he paints a really great portrait of Dallas, Texas in the 1950s. And it's called A Saint from Texas. And in this book, um, a, the father of this family uh, hits big oil out in West Texas and suddenly the family's got a lot of money and they come to Dallas, they move to Dallas, a big house on Turtle Creek. The two twin daughters go to a private school in Dallas. You could probably guess from the detail what private school uh, Edmund White's talking about, but it really kind of, I think, shows um, Dallas at a time when it was becoming a, kind of a, an urban center, pretty cosmopolitan and he talks about downtown and the Turtle Creek area and kind of a lot of the money coming into Dallas. Uh, it's a fun book. It's witty and quirky and really well written. Another book that comes to mind is one that was written um, a few years ago, Love Me Back by Merritt Tears. And I, this is a really great book and one I think that goes very deeply into the class system or, or our different classes within Dallas. The main character is a waitress and she works at various establishments across Dallas, including a big fancy steakhouse. And it just talks about um, a lot of different ethnicities and workers in the restaurant industry and the, the hardships they go through and kind of what most of us don't see when we go out to dine at a nice restaurant. So those are the two books I would recommend. It's a pretty, the Tears book is a pretty searing portrait of, of what it's like to work at a high-end restaurant. Yes. Akwete, what would be your choices? Well, there are a lot of, when people come into our store, uh, of course, uh, we have a, uh, 80% uh, African-American uh, base, but they're looking for a lot of nonfiction. Uh, so for us, um, of course, the newly republished accommodation is one of the most popular books right now, <laughs> but there are other books uh, in Dallas. And I, and I wouldn't just focus on particularly books, but um, for us, uh, we have not always been able to get things published at the rate of other folks. So black newspapers have played a very crucial role in getting stories out about our people and about uh, new published books. There's a book called White Metropolis uh, that also talks about the history of religion and how religion has played a role in the racial um, uh, uh, relationships in the city of Dallas. Um, there is a book uh, that the called Behold the People, and it's a book of photography, photography by R.C. Hickman of, of Black people in Dallas. Um, and then uh, there's an organization called Black Dallas Remembered, who uh, keeps a, a log and a history of happenings and uh, in Dallas and the stories of black and racial relationships in Dallas. And they have a book published called African American Families of Dallas uh, on the inside looking out. So uh, for us, my customer base, they're particularly looking for nonfiction books on the racial history and uh, of Dallas. Uh, the Michael Phillips is the author of White Metropolis, for those who are interested, and it came out from UT Press. Um, 
And it's a, it's a very good supplement to the accommodation. Back to something that you were talking about uh, previously, uh, Will, and that was about Dallas uh, stories. Um, you have uh, started a new line called La Reunion, um, devoted to Dallas stories, Dallas authors. And this is significant because previously, and you still are, primarily a publisher of, of translated books. So why did you start La Reunion? And what are the stories that you're looking for? That's a fantastic question. So um, at the beginning, we did translated literature exclusively because it's sort of what my uh, particular academic focus was, is what my particular interest was. I studied Russian literature in school. But when I moved to Dallas, I uh, did not know a single person here in 2013. And I said, give me five years and I'll meet hopefully enough people that we can start publishing local writers, too, because I have a hunch that local writers from Dallas are equally underrepresented in publishing as writers in translation. And that's why we did so many books in translation is because less than 3% of the books that come out in America every year are translated. So many of the larger presses in New York where sort of corporate publishing is based and where 90% of all the books come from, they're not doing any translations anymore. But as I found out, it's actually true. They're not doing Dallas authors either, right? And like Kwete mentioned, they're not doing black writers from Dallas for sure. And so what's a way to start to meet the writers and galvanize a community and to find those great Dallas stories wherever they are in any genre? So La Reunion was created uh, basically to address these issues of the stories, the undertold and underrepresented stories of our city, our community, our state, really. La Reunion um, is, is hyper-local. La Reunion is obviously named after the sort of failed utopian colony that was established in what's now West Dallas in the 1850s. And uh, that sort of you know, vision for what it could be here uh, had lives on in a lot of ways in Dallas, and it definitely lives on in Deep Ellum. And so it, we're now able to publish books like The Accommodation through this imprint. Well, for us, is to find stories like The Accommodation who are written by writers of color, by women from Dallas, from across the state. And so that we can start to elevate Texas, which is like, as we all know, it's like its own country. But what is the accommodation of Austin? What's the accommodation of Laredo? What's the accommodation of Lubbock? So that we can start to round out what the lived experience of these cities are so that we can process who we are, where we come from, and where we're going. And it was a way for us really more than just doing local stories to really get into nonfiction, a serious nonfiction imprint, to do the kinds of uh, books that grow out of the long form journalism that is so exceptional in our state uh, so that we can start to meet more readers and, and meet more writers too and find out who we are so that we can build a better future together. That's sort of what we do as a nonprofit is like the goal. So far, there have been uh, memoir, essays, uh, uh, history, like the accommodation, but you're saying you're, you're not publishing novels with through that line. Uh, we might one day. Who knows? I think we are next year. Uh, we signed a great novel uh, by a guy named Charlie Alcorn, who's, who's from Victoria, Texas, originally. He's written this amazing novel, a sort of Texas high school football, and it reads almost like a classic Larry McMurtry book. You're going into all the small towns and big cities of the state following this scout and you get into all the intrigue of families and the dynamics of power as they play out in football in Texas, to me, it's a perfect La Reunion book, but it's also a perfect Deep Bellum book. So we have a choice on our hands about which logo to put on the spine, and we'll figure that out next year. So we'll do a little bit of everything. The main goal is to find those stories where they are, and then to use whichever imprint and whichever marketing uh, angle we have on it to connect it to the readers. So that's the most important thing. Is that a contemporary novel? The yes. Alcorn? Yes. Okay. It was in Houston currently. Okay. Um, I think you can tell a lot about a city um, through its independent bookstores, how many there are, the variety, um, how they're doing. Um, so uh, I'm wondering about the, the, the current state of your bookstores. Has the pandemic changed what Dallas readers are looking for, what they're interested in reading? It's going to open up to anyone. Have you seen that change in the last year and a half? I would say uh, at, a books, at a Terabang Books, we've um, we, we've seen an increase in in readership and in reading overall. Um, when COVID hit, I think a lot of people kind of had had more time on their hands, less time commuting. Um, it was a stressful time, so people were looking for something to occupy their minds. And so we found that readership um, has kind of increased and flourished uh, during COVID um, and, and even today. Um, our sales numbers are up, and that's a good thing. And it's across all genres. Of course, there's 
there's some interest in pandemic related literature. We've started seeing some novels and some fiction that's um, that's kind of related to the, to the time that we're in with the pandemic, but um, also nonfiction books. But in general, it's not people kind of wanting to come in and, and read about disease or apocalyptic fiction necessarily, but just things that um, that they're, they were interested in all along and now they're just having the time and and dedicating some more of their their free time to, to reading and books. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, again, I uh, agree. Uh, our sales have increased uh, during the pandemic. And even now, after the pandemic, book sales are up. So uh, overall, you know, at, at the Black bookstores are doing very good right now. Um, and one uh, reason is because of the uprisings that took place uh, during the pandemic with some of the police shootings and things like that. Uh, our customer base and were very intentional on spending their money with Black bookstores and supporting us, uh, Black bookstores. So our sales have gone up uh, and they it has it has not just been a trend black bookstores are doing very well as most bookstores are at this time uh so uh, yeah we saw a increase in readership and of course they were reading everything uh but one good thing is that uh the publishing houses were publishing like crazy books on racism anything about race and they were also publishing republishing black novelists like Octavia Butler and uh, uh, Richard Wright and James Baldwin. They were bringing out books that were kind of sitting on the shelf for 20 years or so. So a lot of black um, uh, writers, things were republished. So people were going back and reading old novels and old literature uh, that uh, was is that was relevant to today, even though they were old books, but the circumstances were relevant to today. So we've seen a, just a great uh, increase and a, just a beautiful rising in the level of consciousness in, uh, in our readership. Will? Yeah, to follow up with our amazing uh, fellow panelists, we've seen a very similar thing. Uh, obviously the pandemic uh, got people reading and I think really appreciating the type of storytelling that books bring. Uh, and, and as a publisher, we saw our best sales year ever last year. We're continuing to have our best sales year ever this year. But in the store, it was a really hard year at first when people couldn't come in as a way to find ways to digitally engage with readers and to give them the stories that they really needed. But this year where we had that, you know, most people are coming in wearing masks and then not masks and now masks get in. Uh, everybody's been really patient. We're a store that used to have events seven days a week. And we would have all kinds of creative writing workshops and readings and slam poetry performances and contests. We would have music and theater. We had a little bit of everything seven days a week. And we haven't done a single event in our store in a year and a half. And that used to be our bread and butter. People coming in for these events at night were really how we paid the rent. And so we've seen this like focus and shift away from event-driven book sales to something different this year. Like Akwete and Lori said, we had a lot of issues-driven uh, readers coming in. They were looking for books to help them understand the current events, especially regarding these new terms that were in the news that a lot of, especially, I mean, let's face it, all white readers had never heard of these terms before, institutional racism. And you had guys in Dallas writing columns in the paper being like, I didn't know there was such thing as racism in Dallas, but here we go. And let's start on a reading journey. And so when people come into our store, we've always been a store that focuses on the underrepresented books, the kinds of books hopefully you don't find in other stores. Now our best selling books this year continue to be Octavia Butler and Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks All About Love is our best selling book of the year. And that's amazing. But you know what? All About Love is the book that everyone needs right now. Right. We need to understand the ability to love each other and ourselves again, to get away from the hate and just all the negativity and to find these bridges between each other. And that's what literature can do and in the most beautiful of ways. And so that's been a really amazing thing. We're a store that's always sold that, but the readership is much more receptive to that in addition to the books that we publish. And we're really hoping to continue to find those gaps. I'll tell you, not just nonfiction, poetry sales are way up for us way up. 
And I think a little bit of that has to do with Amanda Gorman. The Amanda Gorman moment in America has been a really beautiful thing to witness ever since she read the, the inauguration sales of poetry are through the roof. The kinds of poetry that we sell in our store is Amanda Gorman-esque poetry. And so we are trying to put a focus on these amazing young women, young black women, young Mexican-American women doing amazing poetry, coming from performance and slam worlds and bridging that with sort of the book publishing world, which is like, they're usually two different things, but we like to try to serve to uh, to unite those two. And we used to do it through programming and now we're just doing it via uh, recommendations, constant recommendations. Well, uh, inevitably there, there was um, this great search for what do I do now after living, live streaming everything for hours and hours and people turn to books. Has there been uh, any, do you have any sense whether there was uh, interest in local, as in not just the local bookstore, local authors, local topics? Has that Was that an increase as well? over the course of the pandemic so far. I see you nodding, Lori. It, yeah, I, th I think so. I think one of the nice things that happened, if we can find some silver lining with the, the pandemic, is that people started um, really understanding and appreciating small local businesses uh, better, um, locally owned businesses. And so I would say that we've had um, a lot of great response to both virtual events that when we couldn't do live events in the store and also um, live events more recently that focus maybe not so much just on Dallas, but on Texas in general. And I'll give two examples. One of the best-selling books in the store over the past, I guess, maybe 15 months is a novel by the um, the author Brian Washington, based in Houston, and it's called Memorial. And that book is is such a a Houston, Texas book, and it talks about different parts of the city and from a very multicultural um, LBGT kind of kind of way. It's a it's a great novel. We did a virtual event with him that you can still see on Interabang Books website and. And that was a really strong book for us. More recently, we had one of the three authors of the book, Forget the Alamo, um, in the store. And you might recall that that book was rather controversial when Dan Patrick and uh, some other politicians in Texas disinvited the authors to an event at, I think it was a museum um, in Austin. And we had a really great showing um, for that event and, and that book. So. I don't know whether I can speak so much for Dallas centric, but certainly for for Texas books, I, I, I've seen a big interest. Okay. I just think that the uh, pandemic for for my customer base has been one where we have uh, gone within, right, to sort of deal with some. Uh, healing, uh, self-help, a lot of self-help type of books are being sold um, to deal with the healing from racial trauma, right? Because like I said, they're, during the pandemic, for us, it's it's been a little twofold because we've had to deal with a lot of racial disparities. I mean, the, the, the pandemic highlighted a lot of racial inequities and disparities, uh, you know, among uh, disproportionately uh, in with African people, with African-American people. So we've not only had to deal with the pandemic, but also deal with a uh, reckoning of, of, of who we are and this uh, system and its inequity. So a lot, there's been a lot of reading on, on um, there's a book called The Color of Money. It's not written by a Dallas author, but I mean, The Color of Law, uh, that's been really, really popular. It talks about redlining and the uh, the government's uh, complicity in creating wealth and not creating wealth in in black community. So that's been a really big seller. But a lot of self help books on um, uh, spirituality and things like that have been very popular for us during this time. And also there's a local author, uh, Dr. Michael Waters, who has written a children's book. Of course, it's called um, For Beautiful Black Boys Who Believe in a Better World, I think. But it deals with uh, black men and uh, making sure that black men 
you know, have the tools that they need to be strong, uh, you know, people in this in this system that uh, dehumanizes us uh, at some level. So, uh, but that's, you know, that's the pandemic has been, as she said, there's been a silver lining in the pandemic for us, but we've had to deal with a twofold um, pandemic to say so, yes. So picking up on what uh, Will was saying earlier about events, um, that's one of the ways that independent bookstores have, uh, have uh, connected to the community, connected to the local audience, uh, has been uh, is bringing in, in authors. I was just wondering if, if each of you could uh, cite uh, the biggest draws you've had. What really drew people in before the pandemic? Um, any particular authors or any particular topics that brought in people? Well, for what? us, it's... Oh, oh yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying for us, um, events and community programs have always been a huge part of who we are. So it's uh, we've never just been a bookstore per se, but a community space. So for us, uh, programs dealing with um, literacy, you know, um, we have uh, storytelling for children, books, uh, events dealing with uh, all kinds of health and wellness and gardening and uh, things that uh, art, you know, we've had cartooning classes and just anything to help um, help the children during this time when they were not in school, but at home, but to kind of supplement what they uh, would not be getting in school. So we had a lot of children's activities and programs that were huge draws, of course, but uh, basically a lot of self-help information uh, type of events would have been very, very good. Will? For us, the, the sort of biggest draws are always those books that fit the Deep Vellum vibe, not necessarily our author events, but uh, you know, two, two years ago, we did a, an event, Lori mentioned Brian Washington. He's definitely like a citywide favorite. We did a launch event for his first book called Lot and had an extraordinary crowd. And we did an event also two years ago for uh, Hanif Abdurraqib, who wrote a book about a tribe called Quest for UT Press. He was just named a MacArthur genius uh, this past week, uh, very well deserved. Doing events like that um, had just been always so much fun. Um, these are writers we sort of followed um, from day one of their careers. And to be able to host them at any point is amazing. Uh, we also partner up a lot with the Wild Detectives, like one of the other bookstores in town who's not on this call. And just to give them a shout out, they've actually been doing a lot of programming this year outside. They have a beautiful patio. And so they've had a lot of success. They just did their Hay Festival um, in September, which was a lot of fun and had just a great crowd coming out. And I, I will say, anytime we get customers in the store as well as attending events right now, it's a different level of appreciation for like what it means to be a part of this community and how much it really matters to get together in a shared appreciation of storytelling. And that's the thing that unites us all, right? Like all of these different bookstores and all these different neighborhoods is like, we all love great stories and we all love great writing and we all are in this together. And it's amazing. Our city is so much stronger with so many different bookstores in it. And so uh, when we do these events, like we'll, we'll do an event for an author one time, Tara Bang will do it another time, Pan African will host another time, Wild Detectives could another time. That's when it's working because we all have slightly different audiences too that come out to our events. And that's amazing so that we can reach as many readers as possible because there's more readers than there are bookstores in the city. That's for sure. And so uh, as we continue to bring people in, uh, the fun thing is always to bring use literature at the core of events that don't necessarily have to do with a book for sale per se, kind of like what Quinty was saying, saying when you do books about gardening or self-help, um, we would do these sort of different performances and things and, and you're in a bookstore. So the sort of stories are there around you and we incorporate narrative storytelling into those events. Those are always the most fun. It's a blast and like this stuff should be fun. And you know we're a nonprofit. We're supposed to we're supposed to find a way to obviously sell things, but not everything has to be so transactional. Sometimes it's a celebration just to get together, and we want to focus on that too. And it helps you can sell beer or wine. We used to. We don't need more. We don't need more, Jerome. So, and if oh. you're listening to ABC, we don't need more. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jerome, I'm Lauren. so happy that Equete mentioned the children's stuff because it's so true. Um, I think parents are more hungry than ever before to kind of engage their 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 kids in activities and engage their minds. And um, 
we have a, a story time at the store, a uh, live story time on Wednesday mornings and Saturday mornings every week at 1030. And that's really well attended. One of our, um, our favorite authors, a local author to bring into the store is the children's author, Nancy Chernin. And she writes just wonderful, really um, inspirational children's books. And, and it's always a, a great thrill when she comes in and reads one of her books to a group of kids, um, because it's a, really, it's a really special thing. On the adult side, um, uh, this is an older event, but we had a really great turnout. Again, speaking of things, Texas with the author Francis Cantu and his uh, work, it's a memoir mostly called The Line Becomes a River. Um, and we had a really good crowd for that. Another local-ish author uh, who writes on Texas that we had a great event um, within the last 15 months was the author Steve Harrigan, whose big, wonderful thing is absolutely a big, wonderful history of Texas. And people really, um, really responded to, to him and to that book and everything that it has to say about how we think about the history of the state. Um, we talked, we mentioned uh, children's books. Uh, Kwaita, you and I talked about um, black graphic novels and comic books and how they've exploded with the, the rise of, of Afrofuturism in particular. So I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, I am, I'm so excited about this new interest in sci-fi, right? Black sci-fi, and because we didn't always, you've, you've had black sci-fi writers, but uh, we they were not well known, but now you have these Afrofuturistic children's uh, teenage, teen, preteen books coming out that are just fabulous that I want to read, right? So, but sci-fi is huge right now. Uh, they have these beautiful graphics about these, uh, you know, uh, about these African type of uh, characters with, uh, with cultural symbolism and stories in these, in these novels. And also you mentioned the comic books. Of course, Marvel has always been popular, but for, for us, it's even huge now since the Black Panther movie, a lot of people are reading more uh, comics and and um, and animated books. So, uh, and then you have they have uh, uh, animated books about the civil rights movement, graphic books about the civil rights movement that are coming out. There's a great book called um, Oh, it's a it's about black women uh, who resisted. It's a it's a graphic novel. It's a graphic uh, nonfiction book that recently came out. So. Graphics are huge now, um, and I think it's just a different way of attracting a younger audience uh, to to reading more uh, history and different types of sci-fi, different types of, of genres. So, yeah, it's huge. Sci-fi is huge, and and graphic novels. So. It uh, it's such a contrast. I remember, remember the great Richard Pryor joke about after he saw a particular science fiction film. And he said, I have news for you. White people aren't planning to have black people in the future. <laughs> and Afrofuturism is such a, a counter to that. It's, it's become such an exciting, vibrant, uh, fascinating, and, and, and deep uh, genre. It's, it's wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> I'm just pleased that Afrofuturism has gone mainstream. I mean, that's the thing. Like, it's been around and it's been amazing, but like, just the number of readers, especially for young black kids, but like, young white kids love this stuff. I mean, it is good and uh, it's a lot of fun. And like, graphic novels are certainly a door into some serious literature, especially for some kids who are growing up on, on all these superhero movies and, and comics in general. Graphic novels are like the layers of complexity in the art and in the storytelling right now, especially these Afrofuturist texts and in the success of N.K. Jemisin, it's just extraordinary to watch happening. I mean, it's so much fun because, uh, you know, uh, not everybody's going to read uh, my favorite Samuel Delaney books that are like 900 pages long, you know what I mean? So uh, it's okay. And to take that to the future and using graphic novels as a way, it's a, it's a great mixture of art and literature. And so I'm just, uh, I love it too. It's so cool. Staying in the same area, um, Will, you have a, the Deep Vellum is having a zine fest coming up. 
tell us about that. You've, you've often carried zines in the bookstore. Um, why and, and where is that scene going? Uh, you know, this Zine Fest is really the first opportunity to see where Dallas' zine community is going in 2021. We actually don't know. Uh, there was a time, uh, our store definitely was an epicenter, if not the epicenter in Dallas. Uh, we would have zine workshops and zine classes and zine launches. Uh, we had entire shelves of our store dedicated just to zines. And for those who don't know what a zine is, it's like a handmade book, usually very short, and it's a mixture of art and, uh, and text. And it's usually handmade. Uh, usually by one artist. Sometimes groups of people come together for it, and it's it's a lot of fun. It's a very DIY project. And a couple of years ago, there was like definitely something in the water here. It has something to do with the election of Trump. There was a lot of zine making happening that was engaged with social justice, engaged with politics, engaged with getting involved locally. Uh, that the Dallas Public Library created a zine archive. Uh, this we weren't doing it alone. There was like a whole thing going on here. And historically, Denton and the UNT sort of world has been the epicenter of zine culture in DFW, but there are so many amazing writers and creators here. And uh, I will say we have a new uh, store manager who's helping us out with publicity and things as well named Riley Rinhack. She's from Dallas. She moved off to New York to go to college, worked at a bunch of stores up there and moved back during the pandemic and we brought her on and she loves zines. And just like when Christina Rodriguez was managing our store some years ago, she loves zines, we love zines, the community loves zines. Well, by God, we're gonna put zines front and center. And if we're going to be the kind of bookstore that claims to do things like you walk in, you're not going to find New York Times bestsellers on the front table. We want to be anti-commercial. We want to be super deep ellum. That means something to us. And doing zines is a way of engaging with the community uh, <clears throat> on a very introductory level, right? Zines are very small. They're very cheap. They're very fun. And that's something we want to get into. We want to be able to serve as a basis where like this kind of literature and this kind of storytelling is equally valued to like a $30 hardcover book or like super deep Afrofuturist graphic novels. They all live inside the space. It's really valuable for us. And so this zine festival was planned by Gino Dalsin, who is an amazing uh, designer and an amazing zine maker himself. We've been selling his zines in our store for four years, five years. And uh, so he and Riley sort of teamed up and they're like, we want to meet, we want to know who's doing zines right now. So they reached out to everybody in Denton doing zines, everybody in Fort Worth, and said, come on out, let's do this in Dallas again. And there have been some zine fests in the past in Dallas. I think there was one at Wild Detectives three or four years ago, but there hasn't been one in three or four years. And so we were sort of excited to see who this is. And so for those who are into graphic novels, zines are often a way in. It's a way to sketch your art. It, it's supposed to have a handmade quality to it. And for a lot of people who don't know if they can write a book or if they're even literary because the scene is exclusive and elitist, zines are none of that. Zines are fun and for everyone. And so come on in. Uh, everyone come out this Sunday at Deep Vellum Books the, uh, for the first ever Deep Vellum Zine Fest. It's going to be a blast. Moving from the, the, the handmade to, to online, uh, questions of online. Um, Laura, you told me that... Um, perhaps ironically, that Interabang Books actually was better prepared than most bookstores when the pandemic hit um, because of online. Could you explain? I don't know whether most, but I do think that we were better prepared than many. And that uh, requires a little bit of a, a little bit of recent history to, to understand why in October, of 2019, our original store at Preston and Royal uh, in Dallas was completely obliterated by a tornado. Um, and we didn't have a store presence for about a month. And we had been doing online sales prior to the destruction of the store, but we knew that the only sales we were going to have for a period of time before we were able to open at a new location um, was through our online business. And so we got really, uh, really good at the online sales and we kind of perfected that, that procedure and that process. And so when COVID happened and um, foot traffic in stores kind of stopped, uh, we kind of, we're able to say, oh, we, we know what this is like, you know, when you don't have people coming in the door and you still need to make some money as a business. Um, and so uh, we were just able to kind of go right back into really emphasizing um, the online sales. And that's that's really kind of been 
and still is uh, not not just an ancillary part of our business, but a really fulsome part of our business. The fact that people can get online on our website, type in uh, the name of almost any book. And if it's in print, we'll be able to get it to you, either deliver to your home or if you don't want to pay for shipping, we'll bring it into the store. and We'll give you a call when it gets there. So um, the online component has been really vital for our business. Um, I think that, that people often don't think of uh, bookstores as this kind of social communal center. And uh, of course, the pandemic hit uh, the performing arts, the live theater, dance, that kind of thing. But um, it clearly hit bookstores too, as, as Will was saying about the, the lack of, of uh, in-store events. So online suddenly became a, a major issue, particularly for smaller bookstores that didn't have that sort of presence. Um, what can you do to continue that sense of a community, community uh, at, attention a link, um, the way that you can personalize these things with an online presence? How do you make this uh, feel local, feels connected to uh, the, the Dallas market, Dallas people? Any suggestions? Well, I, I'll, just, I'll just say that, you know, from our from our perspective, uh, it always amazes me how many people order something online and then they'll leave a note for one of our booksellers. Um, you know, we've got, we're lucky enough to have booksellers that, that specialize in, in different things. Tyler is great on poetry. Carlos is the to-go to do to guy on music books. And so um, we'll often have people that'll place an online order and say, you know, hey, if you have any other recommendations about books like this, let me know. Um, so there is a lot, it, it's not, I don't want it to seem like Amazon or so much when people buy from us online. There, there is a community element and a real person behind the person processing your order. And there's often an email back and forth communication about the books that people are ordering online and what additional books they might be interested in. Aguete, you were going to say something? Yeah, I think for us uh, as, as, as independent bookstores, you you have this sort of family relationship with your customers. So for us, um, before the pandemic, of course, we we had a very close relationship with our customers. Um, you know, uh, during the pandemic, we we did a lot of curbside uh, type of deliveries. Uh, our health and wellness products really kept us in business. We weren't selling a lot of books online during that time. We did sell some, but our other products, our soaps, our shea butters, our, our other things kind of kept us afloat. But we were, you know, very personable, but have always been very personable. And I think right now um, it, it hasn't changed. The pandemic has made us better at online sales and online and custom orders and making sure people call, we can get what they need. But I think as independent bookstores, we, we automatically have that closeness uh, uh, to our customers. You know, we, we make sure that we take care of them. They want some, we get it or else we're going to hear it. Just like a family member would tell you, they'll tell you how they really feel. So for us, we, um, we're like family and we, we take care of our people and, as we always have, but even a little bit better now because we really appreciate them because <laughs> they can always go to Amazon and get it for cheaper. So they make a conscious political choice to come and shop with us. So that means a lot to us. I'm going to ask a, a big broad question. Uh, maybe there's no specific answer, but we can suggest possible ones. And that is the, um, if you look at the, the Texas literary scene in general, of course you have a lot of uh, authors coming out of Austin for the obvious reasons, the UT Austin, the, the Michener Center, that kind of thing. But there's also, uh, I can name a number of authors associated with, with Houston, Attica Lock, James, uh, I mean, Larry McMurtry wrote three novels set there, Donald Barthelme, um, but Dallas doesn't seem to have the same kind of uh, distinguished history. It doesn't have the same kind of level of 
Uh, one reason, probably because Larry McMurtry didn't like Dallas. He never really wrote about it. But why doesn't Dallas have the same kind of literary presence? Any ideas? Um, well, Jerome, I guess I would say that I, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you on that. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about one of our, um, our writer uh, stars in Dallas, Ben Fountain. The book that he is most famous for, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, is largely based at Cowboy Stadium in Dallas, which is kind of a quintessential, you know, um, Dallas Dallas kind of framework and, and the way to kind of frame a story around, of course, it's talking some, about something bigger than Dallas in terms of the culture of the country overall, but, but Dallas as kind of a microcosm of that. Um, and I think that there are a lot of, authors that either live in Dallas or maybe do not that are beginning to look at Dallas as a as a place to write about and a place of inspiration. Um, there is a an author named Sean Desmond who wrote a, a book last year called Sophomores, which is all about growing up in the 80s in Dallas. And um, I've led book club discussions on that book and it's it's a really popular and interesting book. And I think it gives you a really nice sense of, of what it was like here at that time. So I don't know that, um, that we don't have a writing culture or we don't inspire writers. I just think that, um, that maybe we need, we need to do a lot more to kind of bring those stories up. And, and I think that's what we're all sitting here wanting to do in terms of, highlighting and magnifying the stories that Dallas has to tell. Because I think Dallas, to your point, is a quintessentially very much an American city. It uh, can easily stand in, um, as the state has, as a, as a kind of metaphor for America at large. And so I'm, I'm often curious as to, to uh, why authors haven't employed that more often, to get beyond the, the J.R. Ewing uh, kind of cliches uh, to actually see how this this city works or doesn't work, um, and uh, that's what I one of the things I've been fascinated by is that the, that it's easy to see the city as this kind of you know, gleaming business town, and yet once you start learning more about it, as Will has discovered is, since he's been here, there are all these other stories, um, and I th I'm curious as to if there's anything here that's somehow lacking that we don't have that fosters that kind of artistic bent. I mean, there are a lot of local people publishing books a lot, but for us, they're not telling the stories of Dallas or telling more personal uh, stories of how they have, you know, uh, overcome certain difficulties in this city in relationship to drugs or something like that. But they're writing, a, there are a lot of, a lot of people writing books, but not necessarily about the history of Dallas or our stories of Dallas. So but there are a lot of uh, new authors here for sure. Will, any theories since you've been here? We've lost your sound, Will. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, yeah yes. So I, yes, we can. I, have a, I do have a couple theories about this. And so it's, it's interesting. You mentioned Donald Barthelmay, who founded the creative writing program and the MFA at the University of Houston. And then uh, you mentioned UT Austin and their Missioner Center as well. And so something that North Texas has always lacked is an MFA program, a Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. It's a very important degree in sort of the history of post-war American literature, not necessarily because it's the right thing, but because it's an integral piece in what's a literary ecosystem. And so when I founded Deep Vellum, I know I started out doing translated literature, but the goal had always been to be an outspoken advocate for the literary arts and their place in Dallas and had a 10 year strategic plan to do all the things that we've done today. And these things that we needed, it's not that there wasn't cool things in Dallas before. It wasn't there were not bookstores in Dallas before. Larry McMurtry did write about Dallas. He wrote about how he hated Dallas, but he also wrote about the amazing bookstores in Dallas. 
He used to visit bookstores all throughout the city, including a bookstore in Deep Ellum. That is where Twisted Root Burger is now, right by uh, Commerce Street and the freeway underpass, right? To resurrect a literary like history of this entire city, you need an entire ecosystem to connect the dots between these stars that have happened in Dallas, to look at the constellation of what literature means to the city, right? You need an organization to be able to step up to say, who is that? who's not just publishing a book, who's not just writing a book, who's not just selling books at a bookstore, who's not just doing their own literary nonprofit here, but to say, this is a community. There is such a thing as a literary Dallas. It involves stakeholders like the city to start funding literary arts organizations and to start giving money to writers as artists, which the city of Dallas now does and did not do in 2013. That's a big change. The city of Dallas has never had a poet laureate. What does a poet laureate mean for a city? Well, Amanda Gorman, who I mentioned earlier, she started as a youth poet laureate of Los Angeles, and now she's the shining rock star of all American poetry. The next Amanda Gorman's in Dallas, and we now have a program to support the Amanda Gormans of Dallas to get them into the literary community and to get their voice heard internationally. That's huge. That's through the city and the Dallas Public Library. It takes the public library stepping up with programming and being able to stock things like zines and local books to be able to create a culture of readership. It takes bookstores. It takes KERA hosting three bookstores on a talk about the state of the arts. That's amazing. So all these things are what it takes, right? Dallas is and has always been a literary city, but not all of those nodes were being connected before we got here. And so we have amazing creative writing program at SMU. We have the Southwest Review, the second oldest literary journal in the country. And yet all of these different nodes of Dallas didn't necessarily know that. Maybe some people listening today didn't know that the Southwest Review has been at SMU for over 100 years. They still continue to do incredible work. But SMU, as we all know, is also not in the city of Dallas. This is important in terms of when we think about where the money goes and who it works and what communities are being served by literature and how it can be seen as elitist. We need the literature and the community of our literature and literary scene in Dallas to serve all the Dallases into one entity. And that's hard. That's real hard. And so it's been amazing to see a lot of stakeholders step up in recent years. It's been amazing to see so many new bookstores open as Taka is now funding the literary arts for the first time. That's important. Uh, the city's giving grants, as I mentioned, to writers. That's important to be able to work with the universities to get writers going, because if they're not going to create an MFA program, which helps create all the ecosystem steps, it supports bookstores, it supports writers, it brings writers to town, which is really important, to live, to teach, to give lectures, to engage with the city. We need a whole lot more of that, and we need it in a lot of different venues throughout the city, right? That's an important thing. So those are some of my things. But the number one thing that you mentioned about Houston and Austin that we don't have, the thing missing in North Texas, our region of 8 million people, is we don't have the MFA and creative writing program. UT has two, Houston has one. And then out of those, we're born lots of other programs and initiatives that support writers at every step of their journey. Because it's not like Austin's a more literary city than Dallas. It just has a few different resources, right? And so it's about how we all get together to utilize those resources. Forgive me for the rant, but I am very passionate about this. <laughs> I, I, I agree with everything you've said. I've written about uh, a lot of that with one caveat. When I had written about uh, the lack of, of uh, writing programs, UNT contacted me, reminded me that they do have a graduate writing program. It's not necessarily- Graduate, it's not an MFA. It is a, it is a master's and a PhD. It is something totally different. It is amazing, but it is not- We just lost Will. <laughs> Maybe UNT cut him off. Yes, I think so. Uh, Will, we just lost you there for a second. We thought UNT had cut you off. <laughs> I think they did. Uh, it was probably my good friend, George Getschel. UNT is amazing, but um, they, they, they are not the only thing. And they don't have the MFA. It is a certain type of degree right. that creates a certain type of ecosystem, and they can't do it alone. But again, anytime you say things, then someone can poke back and say, I do something cool. And we're like, we just need to draw a line and see the bigger picture and how it all connects so that Denton and Dallas are in conversation and Fort Worth and Collin County are also equally served. It's, it's a lot of work and they do amazing work up there. We work with a lot of those PhD graduates. Speaking of these kinds of uh, this literary ecosystem, we've had a new addition and that's thanks to you, Lori. I was wondering if you could talk about the Republic of Consciousness Prize for Small Presses. Yeah. What Thanks, motivated Carol. you to start it? I'm really happy to do that. So the genesis of this uh, actually started with my podcast, Across the Pond. Um, my podcast partner is a publisher 
uh, a small press publisher in the UK, Sam Jordison. Um, his press is Galley Beggar Press, which he runs with his wife. And uh, we were talking before recording one of these days, and I was able to congratulate him because one of his books had been shortlisted for something in the UK called the Republic of Consciousness Prize. And it's a prize that I had been following for a while for small presses that actually gives money to small publishers. And um, I was just talking to Sam and saying how great it was and you know it, that it seems strange that we didn't have something like that in the US as far as I knew. And he offered to get me in touch with the people that uh, organized the prize in the UK and I started speaking to them and they said that no one in the US uh, had really talked to them seriously about starting the prize here. And it kind of went from there. And so um, we were able to announce the start of the prize on August 30th of this year. Uh, submissions for the prize for the prize year 2022, which is our inaugural year, uh, are now open. They opened on October 1st, and they will be open through the end of November 2022. And we're really looking forward to reading the submissions to kind of helping get the word out about small publishers and small presses and um, encourage everyone to go to our website. It's republicofconsciousnessprize-usa.com and to follow us on Twitter. I'll put that plug in there too, at usrofc. Oh no, it's just Twitter. Yes, at usrofc. So um, yeah, it's an exciting thing and I hope that it'll help generate some excitement and and help amplify the voices of small presses. So this is not a, a prize for a particular author, for a particular book. It's for the year's output from a particular press. It, the, it is a prize to a press for one particular book that they publish in the calendar year that they submit to us. So we're judging on a book, but the whole purpose of the prize is to help small presses that, um, that really need the money and the support and often run on very low budgets, whether they're nonprofit or for-profit entities. And the, the purpose is to uh, draw attention to uh, small presses. Why? Well, I think that um, small presses have always been, um, you know, in recent years, at least in recent decades, kind of on the cutting edge of uh, publishing really exciting stuff. Will knows more about this than anyone in terms of what kinds of things he and his colleagues at other small presses in the country kind of take a chance on, take a risk. Um, they're not really publishing based on purely commercial considerations, but just because there's an exciting new voice out there and it deserves to be recognized and it deserves for people to be reading the work. And um, also more recently, unfortunately, what were a handful of really big publishing conglomerates have just started getting bigger and more massive and more centralized. And that um, naturally just limits and uh, kind of narrows the number of voices that get heard because you've got uh, people in offices in New York that are making editorial decisions for what 90% of the books in most bookstores represent. And you're not really getting a diversity of voices out there that I think small presses are in the best position to do for us. So we have only a little time left. I want to do a, a quick um, circle around uh, our guests. Um, if each of you could suggest uh, uh, one book, one author that you would recommend that you don't think people have paid enough attention to. Um, just uh, one thing that, that you think is really worthwhile and, and want to pitch. Um, so who is telling the story that, that you want people to read? Akwete? Mm, good, good question. Akwete. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. There's a book yes. called, there's a book called Post-Traumatic Slave Disorder. 
It's by a sister named Dr. Joy DeGruy. And so it just talks about how historically the um, psychological trauma that a lot of people, descendants of African people and descendants of slaves are still sort of dealing with this trauma of, of slavery. So it's a really good history book, but it, it sort of kind of goes into the social and psychological positioning of Black people here in America today. So it's a good book, Dr. Joy DeGruy. It's not a Dallas author. Just, uh, uh, children's books are really huge right now. So one of the children's books I'm pushing is by a Dallas author, Doc, Dr. Michael Waters. Again, it's called uh, For Beautiful Boys Who Believe in a Better World. So. Thank you very much. Will? Can't hear you again, Will. I have to give a shout out to uh, a book we published last year um, in April, which was a bad time to publish a book uh, by a debut, a debut writer named Fozia Karimi, who is an Afghan-American writer, lives in Denton. Her debut novel uh, about a family fleeing war and persecution in Afghanistan and coming to America and setting up life um, with memories of the old world and the author herself illustrated the book. There are full color illustrations throughout. The entire text is set in multiple colors. There's family photographs in it. So it's a, a sort of fictionalized version. It's very dreamlike. It's set up as an abecedary. So it's set up from an A to Z. A is for you know whatever and B is for whatever. And it's just the most beautiful book we've ever published at Deep Vellum. It won some cool smaller prizes uh, for debut writers and for Texas writers. Uh, it didn't quite get the same readership it would have gotten if she was out on tour last year, which had been the plan. But it is, uh, to date, the most stunning literary work we have ever published at Deep Ellum. And um, it's something we're so proud of and that she's she's local, right? She's she's from our world. And uh, it's just it's one of the most gorgeous things. It's called Above Us, the Milky Way, an Illuminated Alphabet by Fozia Karimi. And you can check it out on our Thank website you. or at all your favorite indie bookstores. And Lori, real quick. Um, real quickly, I'm going to give a shout out to the work of the author Gail Jones. Uh, the New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine did an expose about her and her work. She is out with a new novel called Palmares, which is about um, a free slave colony in Brazil um, in, you know, years ago. But she's got a whole body of work that's been kind of under-recognized. She was first discovered um, uh, by Toni Morrison and first published at Penguin Random House when Toni Morrison was there. And I'm, I'm really hoping that she's going to get a second wind and, uh, and more readers will will come to her and come to her work. And um, her new novel, I think, should be should be one that people really look to and, and pick up. The author's name, again, is Gail Jones. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, uh, all of uh, our guests this afternoon. Uh, Lori Feathers of uh, Interabang Books, Will Evans of a Deep Vellum Publishing, a Deep Vellum Bookstore, and Akwede Tahimba of uh, Pan-African Connection. I'd also like to thank the Dallas Museum of Art for co-hosting today's State of the Arts. Um, and I hope to see all of you in your bookstores. Again, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.